What's up guys? It's Pete from Pete's Basement. We're actually standing at our official F2 Pete's Basement booth here at the New York Comic Con. The place is madness already. We found one of our great fans, Jorge Burgos. What are you looking forward to in the convention? Um, mainly meeting the artists, and, um, finally meeting you guys in person, and and having having a great time. Enjoying the women at the convention? Yes, because oh, women. New York, New York City, you know. Oh, yeah. oh. New York City women in smaller outfits and comics. What more can you ask for? And great fucking fans. I just happened to pass back by our booth because when Danny and I started walking around, I forgot the cards. And I run into Steve Zanota here, who happens to be looking at the tanks up in our logo there. And Steve looks on his iPad <laughs> and has the self-same tanks. So obviously... So now, Steve, you're obviously a neighborhood guy. I grew up in Greenpoint, Williamsburg, my, till I was about 20 years old. Um, left there, was into comics my entire life. Grant Street Bookstore, I don't know if you know where that was. I used to go there with my grandmother all the time. Sid's Egg Creams mm -hmm. on the corner, Bushwick and Grant Street. Best, best egg creams in Brooklyn, by the way. Um, we do a show on all3egos.com. That's A-L-T, the number three, R-E-D-E-G-O-S.com. What is the show about? What's uh? Well, what we like to do, we cover comics from two different angles. We like to bridge the gap between observation and obsession. What we do is we'll take the guy who just goes to see the Captain America movie. Maybe he's a little bit more interested about it. He wants to find out a little more. He can check us out. Then we have another part of the show for the hardcore geek, the guy who says, Professor Erskine doesn't look like that. You know, they, they didn't call him by the rays. So that's the kind of thing. We try and bring those two types of people together. Maybe they can meet at some common ground and we can all love comics like we should. So. Dude, lots of luck. Enjoy the show, Thank man. Thank you. So we're here at Comic-Con with the great, 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 Great Olivia. If you don't know who the hell Olivia is, okay. turn off the show, go pick up a Playboy, go Google her. My new book. Go pick up her book. It's a, I'm sure it's on Amazon and every damn place else where. I mean, okay, I'm kind of stuttering here and ranting because I'm a huge fan. I had just came out with a new book, uh, Malibu Cheesecake. It's only two months old. And so I'm here. Uh, selling my my new book i haven't been to this comic con this is my first time in new york i was here maybe 15 years ago at a different comic con but the major snowstorm it was so bad i think the mayor said don't go out so i mean it was pretty bad Our but loss. this is my first time i've always been uh, going to the san diego comic con i've been going there like 25 years so i thought i'd give it a try out here you know up here this is also I lived in New York 20 years, so this is my right. old hometown, too. I love New York, and I'm really thrilled to be back here. Well, New York loves you. And if you came back after Googling her, you know that she is the queen of cheesecake pinups. I saw her in the pages of Playboy. And many times I prefer her artwork over the actual pinups. You've been doing this for 35 years, you say? I've been doing it 35 years, but I've been working with Playboy for the last 10 years. And have... Hef does the uh, the captions, so it's kind of, I'm really lucky I get to work with Hef, so I'm also friends with him, so I... You're friends with Hef? Yes. We're regulars up there. We're, we've been really lucky. We've been going up there 25 years, 
And in the book it shows, Hef has been using my work as the party invitations. I get to go to the parties too. Uh, my, as I'm party jealous. Is, they're pretty fabulous. Okay. I'm a huge fan of hers, but I have a little bit of hate right now for her. <laughs> just, just a little bit. 25 years of Playboy parties. No, no. So many things I can say right now, but I'm behave. I'm gonna behave. So um, her newest stuff is Malibu cheesecake, which looks awesome, sexy, beautiful, pink. You're also really famous for doing Betty Page. What brought you to Betty? You know, I, I painted Betty like in the late '70s, uh, and what brought me to Betty is that I was. Uh, friends with somebody who was managing, it was also a friend, also had a collection of Betty uh, photographs from the 1950s. And he said, Here, you want to use a, a, a model? You want to use, because I didn't have models, so I used Betty as a model. If you don't know who Betty Page is, fuck you. Pamela Anderson, I, uh, we asked her to be a model right before she, her fame hit. Okay. So it was really fun watching her star rise. It was just an amazing thing to see because one day she's on uh, a show. What is that show? She's the Tool Time Girl. Yeah. Um, and then she Home said, yeah, and she comes back and poses for us and she's going, you know, I'm trying out for this show called Baywatch. And then it just, it's the most amazing thing. I wouldn't go so far as to say you helped her rise. Mm, yeah, she, you know, no, no, I mean... I'm not taking away nothing from her beauty, her charisma, her character, but your art is timeless when it comes to advancing women. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I have Dita, who's on the cover. Dita Von Teese? Yes. And is on wow. the cover. She's awesome. And um, we photographed her in 2000, and, you know, watching her become, you know, the queen, just a queen. Yes. And I'm working with her still, I'm doing burlesque posters, and, and, um, I'm hoping um, I'm hoping to do a doll with her, so I'm still working on a lot of things with her. She's she's great lady, grand lady. So I got great. I'm working with great. Got Misumi Max, who's awesome. Love Misumi is just she's a little contortionist doll. Julie Strain said to us, you know, I have this model who's a contortionist, and my husband is back. With, oh yes. Oh yes, we want the contortionist, you know, she, yes, she bends like a toy. If you're thinking, oh, who's perfect, I don't need that. There's so many beautiful women. What you need is somebody who's got, it doesn't matter. You know, she just has to have this inner beast, you know? And it comes out, you know, that, that inner just, uh, woman just shows up and it's so sexy. You know, all these women I've got are so beautiful to begin with, but they all have such different personalities. We're here with Brian. Now, what exactly, what's the, with the ensemble? All this. Well, Tell us about it. I'm kind of a mad scientist. All right. Obviously. And my favorite t-shirt thus far. That's awesome. Where did you get that t-shirt? Um... Uh, the, I got it off DeviantArt. Uh, one, there was a I, there was an artist I follow on DeviantArt, and he usually does T-shirt prints, and this was one of them. Warning, science ahead. I, you, first thing I always do is hang out in Artist Alley, which almost always guarantee bra drains my bank account. Mm -hmm. And I was stupid enough to bring credit cards today. Bad move, man. I learned that lesson. Stop that shit. Yeah. walking past here and I saw this awesome crazy looking poster for Dark Age got this skull with the fucking machine guns in the mouth and everything and we're here with Nick who is uh, now you are in charge of this is, yeah, is this I'm your one of the creation yeah. tell us about this I want to know what's going well, on basically I'm, I'm the co-creator of this uh, graphic novel um, we're doing a special deal just for the graphic uh, for the comic con this year where we're selling the book and a t-shirt at a special price but um, the book itself is a vision of the future and our vision of the future is very similar to what's happening right now. So what you're getting is a very small minority of rich people that are living in this utopian world 
whilst the rest of us live in this dystopian world with nothing and the rich good word destroy us. so um, we wrote it about five six years ago and it's quite amazing how it's coming true right now so um, we're quite happy uh, with how it's going uh, a lot of people are being interested in talking about the future of the world and this is what we see is see what's going to happen if the world keeps continue uh, on the path that it's going on now are you the artist the writer both I'm the artist and I co-wrote it uh, my brother, is, who is actually my twin brother, he's also, he uh, was the inker and he did some colouring as well and some design as well. And he also wrote it with me. There's only two of us on this project and we're self-published. So I'm assuming you did that cover right there? Yeah, we did that cover, yeah. That is phenomenal. The artwork. Can I ask what medium you used to get that? We used a lot of different mediums, some uh, like illustrating from uh, photographs, piecing things together, cutting them out. So it's like a cut and paste kind of idea. And then we did the graphic design. I mean, we come from a graphic design background and typography. So a lot of people who buy typefaces and things like that or follow graphic design may actually know us through our uh, pen names identical. Um, so that's pretty much where we're from. And this is our first book together. Where can people get this book? Is it available like on Amazon? You have a you website? Get, yeah, Amazon.com. They sell it there. Um, you, can re you can search for Dark Age Trilogy and it'll come up. You could buy it from our Facebook uh, page or our, our particularly our website you can buy it online um, online it's uh, www.darkageepic.com um, on Facebook just search the Dark Age Trilogy and it should come up so so this is the first in a series of three you say right yeah in the trilogy we've already started on the second book both book two and three are written already just a matter of drawing it and putting it together uh, book two should launch uh, some point next year we're here at the Archie booth. We're here with Ian, the writer of Mega Man, and Paul. Paul, what do you do in the book? Before I start talking to Ian and begging him for plot lines and stuff. I'm the editor on the book. What was it that got you started initially with, hey, let's do a Mega Man book? Um, uh, Capcom actually came to us and, uh, and asked us about adapting the property. They had heard we were interested in uh, expanding our video game titles from Sonic the Hedgehog. And uh, we had a you know 17-year history at the time with Sonic the Hedgehog comics, so what better place to go for uh, for Mega Man comics than Archie? And um, from that, it was a quick phone call to Ian, at which I heard lots of squealing and uh, delight, and then it went to spaz, and it all rolled from there. I can definitely say that I'm you know I loved the book right from Jump Street. I was. I don't know why I'm saying the word was. I am the biggest nerd when it comes to just comics and stuff. And Mega Man was like one of the first Nintendo games I ever had, specifically Mega Man 2. Which, um, first of all, I want to say how great you've adapted the just the concept of the character. Uh, the artist, I just want to say right off the bat, has he's like taken the feel from the original cartoon. I don't know if they, they Capcom gave you you know screenshots or whatever it was, but he's just taken that and pulled it right into the comic. It looks phenomenal. Spaz does that in his free time. Uh, he's been practicing this series since he was a little kid. So that's how he got the, it, the art is second nature to him, definitely. I can obviously tell that you have no shortage of, you know, footage and stuff like running around in the Mega Man universe. Um, obviously we're going to start with you know the first Robot Masters. Uh, do you have a favorite Robot Master and were you a fan obviously of the original game and whatnot? I was always a fan of Mega Man but I couldn't play the games to save my life. You know how when Mega Man 10 they introduced that super easy mode where they cover all the pits and everything dies in one hit? That's for people like me <laughs> because I'm terrible at it. But I love the series. Always been a big fan of the mythos itself. Um, and I was really excited when we got this project. And out of the original Robot Masters, I got to pick Gutsman. Gutsman is phenomenal. He's hilarious. I love writing Gutsman. I'm going to tell you this, and this is the only time, I said this on the show too, when uh, the, I think Mega Man was up to around issue two or three at the time. It was early on, and you guys only did a four issue arc for the first story. And then so. Now, I've been complaining about a lot of other arcs going for just way too long, dragging themselves out, and this is the greatest compliment you'll ever get. This is the very first time I ever said, wow, I wish this would go longer. I wanted one book per Robot Master, and I would have bought it happily and sat there grinning from ear to ear reading it. I love the fact that he uses all the different weapons and actually uses the weapons that the other Robot Masters were weak against. Did that take you a long time to research or did you know it off the top of your head? Did Capcom give you that information? Uh, that was part of what I researched. Uh, that was part of how I structured the first arc was how do we get this to move along quickly. 
and one of the easiest ways would be which weapon would be uh, best suited. And since this is the first game, and everybody knows the first game, we didn't want to dwell too long on it. So having it move along quickly like that and use the pattern that most po people already know seemed like the most logical way to do it. Now, I was expecting truthfully that for the story to go in order, and I guess I was a little silly for that. So now we've introduced Time Man, and for the life of me, it escapes me who the other character is that helped Wily escape. Oil Man. Now, what game are they from? They're from Mega Man Powered Up. It was a remake of the original Mega Man on the PSP. It was done in uh, with 3D models, uh, very SD style. And to make it match with all the other Mega Man games that had the eight Robot Masters, they introduced Time and Oil Man. So after we wrapped up the first arc, which was pretty faithful to the original game, we're taking time to do more of an original story arc where we bring in Time and Oil Man, pace ourselves a little differently, and then after that, we're going to move on to Mega Man 2 as a more faithful adaptation. And the initial plan, you know, just currently thinking, is we're going to kind of jump back and forth. Game adaptation, something a little more original. Game, something a little more original. And see how that works. Not that we're, that's set in stone. We'll play with the formula if we need to. But that's the thinking as we're going in. Now, I won't beg you for any kind of plot details or anything, but I will be forced to ask you one question. When I got Mega Man 2 was the very first Mega Man game I got because I started a little late to get Mega Man 1. Metal Man was the very first guy I went after. And I didn't care what he was weak against. I made sure I was going to beat him with my Mega Buster. And it took me a while. Took, there was a couple of four-letter words. There was a couple of Nintendo <laughs> controllers thrown at the screen. I was maybe 11. But I'm Italian, so, you know, I hear Grandma, and that's all I, you know, whatever. When can I expect to see Mega Man, uh, Metal Man in the comic? May, uh, Metal Man will be showing up in the third arc. Uh, the, the, entire, the entirety of Mega Man 2 will be in the third arc. And one thing that uh, people were responding to in the first arc was that we went through the light robot masters a little quick. They wanted to see a little more of a fight. So for the next, for the Mega Man 2 arc, we are going to make Brock fight for his life against every single one of these guys. It's going to be brutal, each and every one of those fights. You, you see the smile on my I face, like that right? Smile. Yeah. That, that's what I'm here for, to make that smile. Dude, you have made this nerd very happy. That's Thank you, you for a great story. Thank you, sir. Lots of luck in the future, man. Here with Jason Goodman, the CEO of Atlas Comics. Jason, how long have you been the CEO of Atlas? Well, I've been the CEO since we relaunched uh, last year at New York Comic Con, but uh, you know it's been in my blood forever. My grandfather, Martin, founded Marvel Comics, and uh, my grandfather and my father, Chip, founded Atlas Comics in 1975. So uh, it's been in my blood for a long time. What was it that made you take these characters from the 70s who were, you know, I, I had no idea who they were until I first saw you guys coming out with them, and then I heard that, oh, these guys have been out for a while, and I went back and researched, you know, who they they were. I actually picked up the first issue of the Grim Ghost on eBay. What made you take these characters and start them over? Um, I gotta say, in some respects, market demand. I mean, I had I had kept the titles and lovingly maintained the intellectual property for years, but eventually the fan mail started bursting through, and everybody's like, "Dude, relaunch! Come on, we want comics, we want video games, we want movies. Just do it already." So, I just did it already. Do you have a favorite that you've started so far? Well, you know, you never really have a favorite child, or at least you never admit to it. <laughs> but, you know, really, I want them each to be special in its own way. So we're, we've launched in different genres. So I've got Wolf with Sword and Sorcery. I've got Grim Ghost, sort of supernatural horror. I've got Phoenix, who's my kind of superhero, but definitely sci-fi. And now I've got Atlas Unified that we're launching at Comic-Con this year, which is our first crossover event, and bringing in many other characters from the original 1970s Atlas. So I actually saw that at the end of the last wolf issue when they brought in iron jaw and i was like who i had to go, I, I mean i had to look that one up again well we do a lot of characters and you know some of them will be independent launches some of them will launch from within or just spin out of so uh you know we were inspired by nat jones artwork in wolf he was so good originally with sanjin the main bad guy's iron mask and so all of a sudden we just started talking iron jaw and uh steve niles spun his magic and before you know it Iron Jaws on the cover. So now, let's take it from you know somebody else who may not know all of Atlas's characters and everybody that the 70s company had to offer. How many more characters are there really out there for you guys to just draw around and bring into the modern world? 
Well, there's about 27 different titles, and of course within those titles there are plenty of characters, heroes, villains, you know, important people, tertiary characters, all of the above. But there are about 27 titles um, that we could relaunch from the 70s, and probably not all of them are destined for their own book, um, but you know, certainly Destructor is a major uh, superhero character that Atlas originally did. Um, we've got uh, The Brute, Planet of Vampires, Demon Hunter. Um, so for people who are familiar with you know the characters and who you're portraying here, you've got a lot more WTF moments lined up like you did with the end of Wolf last issue. Uh, many more, and we're, you know we're really thankful. I get emails from France. When are you coming out with Tiger Man? Le Tigre. You know it's uh, it happens all the time. So uh, we're thankful that there are fans out there who remember even our most obscure characters, and uh, we promise that they'll continue to make appearances. Now I'm I'm just I'm not gonna beg you or anything for storylines, plot. Where the, where's this guy going or what? I'm just gonna say this for the record now since we're on film. The Grim Ghost was obviously the first one that I tuned into. I wound up liking Phoenix even more so. I've never never experienced Phoenix before. I really do like the series. Sure. Um, but Grim Ghost, it looks like I like the fact that he was like you know kind of a bastard, kind of an anti-hero in that regard. Exactly. And it looks like you're really kind of brooding, like grooming Michael to be the new Grim Ghost as opposed. And I don't know if you're going to turn this guy into a bad guy or what's going on. Can you give us any insight at all, or do you want to just like tell me, like, shush? Well, I, I feel comfortable saying that you're somewhat on the right track, but I feel one of the things that makes the Grim Ghost so interesting is that there is this flexibility and fungibility between the characters. Who's really good, who's not, who, you know, everybody's a little bit dirty, for lack of a better word, but also everybody has a lot of decency to them, and what shines through at particular moments is uh, hopefully something that Tony Isabella will surprise me with, I'll surprise you with and uh, you know it'll continue to roll out that way. Speaking of like you know the undead characters and these kind of supernatural powers I just I have to ask you at least one nerd question that has actually been posed to me recently by a couple of our fans really. I hope I'm a good enough nerd to answer. And you know a biased answer is perfectly acceptable. Who do you think would win in a fight? Grim Ghost or Spawn? Oh you know it's Grim Ghost. <laughs> totally biased. I'm not even gonna think about it. Hey guys, I'm here at Comic Con 2011. 11? Yeah. With Ralph Tedesco of Xenoscope Comics. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are Is you? Is this your first New York Comic Con? No. It's our fifth? Our regular stuff. Grim Fairy Tales, of course, was the uh, is our Bread flagship. And Bread and Butter. <clears throat> uh, Wonderland. Uh, we have a new Wonderland series coming out. Yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Which, awesome. uh, which is going to be cool. Yeah, Art Germ did the cover. Uh, Ebass, of course, did another cover for us. Um, Fly's new. Yes, we, we recently reviewed that. We love it. Oh, you love it? Cool. Love it. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's getting really cool reviews. It's sort of like Breaking Bad meets superheroes. Uh -huh. um, and what else do we have new? Um, well, Charm we've been doing for a little while. That's yeah. licensed property. The Waking. and Oh, Grim Missing, Le Missing Legends, which is a spinoff of our Grim Fairy Tales title. I don't know yeah. if you guys checked that out yet. Um, I love Grim Fairy Tales. Great stuff. But my favorite of all time is The Waking. The Waking is incredible. Can we get a second volume? I'll put up the waking right there for you guys. Um, second volume, we will come out with it. I just don't know when. Oh, you're breaking my heart. It is. It'll come out in maybe 2012. Any other stuff options for a film? Uh, Piper. Uh, Piper was um, optioned in July. Um, Mandalay Vision. Uh -huh. uh, it's a I don't know if you read it. It's a spin-off of our Grim Fairy yeah, Tales yeah, universe. Yeah. So that's with uh, Mandalay. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So I love this shit. Your shit is wonderful, dark. Plenty of beautiful women on the cover. You guys are producing good shit and succeeding. Congratulations. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's, uh, of course, the fans who follow us is what, first and foremost, that's what's important is the guys like you. You know what I mean? So You're welcome. Keeping us, uh, keeping us going. On a side note, a couple of years back, you had like harem women hanging around. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, <laughs> to the women, the, the actual harem? There, there don't have naked women There's no there. naked women. We just have Lauren today, but, but uh, I mean, she's almost naked. What the wrong with that? <laughs> and I'm here with Dominic and Patrick from Pronto Comics. Fellas, let us know why you're here. Oh, we're here to get the word out about Prano Comics and what we're doing, pranocomics.com. We're a collective of creators, and we're working to self-publish to get into the industry. That's our main goal. And uh, what do you do for Pronto Comics? I am head of marketing. So if you have a comic book that you want to write that no one else wants to do, we'll do it. Bring it by. We'll find you an artist. We'll find you a writer. Whatever you want to do, you can do it at Pronto Comics. Uh, what is the current uh, comic book that you're right now uh, publishing? Currently we have like several uh, that you can get either at a local comic book store or online at piranacomics.com backslash store. We have Blackout, which is an anthology all happening during a blackout in a, the imaginary town of Vineville, New York. And we also have System Failure, written by Josh Cabrera, a managing editor. Uh, it looks fantastic. You can find that like in St. Mark's or out in Long Island or even uh, in New Jersey. Cool, cool. Now uh, on the marketing tip, what are you doing to get uh, Pronto Comics out there into the public? Well, you guys can follow us on Twitter so at Pronto Comics. Pronto Comics Online, you can check out our store, all our websites, all our information, all news updates at ProntoComics.com. Now, uh, how long has Pronto Comics been established? Uh, we've been at it for about two years. We started out of Andy Schmidt's comics experience class. I highly recommend it. Very good way to learn about comic books. And I got involved through Buddy Scalera's uh, Creator Connections, which is actually later today, around 6.15. And we came together, we produced an anthology called For Price, and we're like, hey, let's keep going. Let's keep going till we're really in the industry. And that begat kicked, and then we started really trying to turn this into a company. Check out uh, Comically Absurd's Comics. Hopefully it comes out this summer. Uh, it's a comic anthology, and it will be featuring uh, Bacon Boy and Super Spam. This is Penny Dreadful here at Comic-Con 2011, and I'm here with John Hazard of Frankenstein Superstar. Tell us a little bit about your comic here. Uh, Frankenstein Superstar is a funny horror comic about Frankenstein and his bride living in New York City. That's kind of cool. I was looking at the pictures and I see that I liked that the girls were kind of you know, kind of thick. They were a little healthy looking. That's partly personal preference and it's a little bit of a statement. You know, they're like different than most of the girls you see on TV and in the movies and stuff. Is this only available on the web or will you maybe one day get it on print? Yeah, yeah, I'm following kind of the classic webcomic model, uh, which is, you know, kind of put it out for free. I've, I've uh, started in April, and when I have enough, I'm going to collect it into a book and sell it to the fans. Now, what inspired you to come up with Frankenstein Superstar, living in New York and dealing with the same problems, you know, that we have to deal with? Um, well, I, I've always identified with Frankenstein. Uh, you know, I'm kind of big and weird looking and, and uh, he's very awkward and sort of doesn't fit in with normal people and I've always kind of felt that way. And so I felt like I had a lot to say through the character and I've always just loved him and the movies. You know, Bride of Frankenstein is one of my favorite movies and um, it just, it, it was just a good artistic vehicle for me to be able to talk about both myself and about sort of real world things. So he's going to have like love problems with the Bride of Frankenstein, is it love hate, or is their relationship pretty good? Uh, their relationship is pretty good. Um, I mean, he's like a monster and he kind of screws up a lot and so, you know, she like she has problems with that and uh, I mean, right right now like a part of the story is that he sort of used to be famous as the real Frankenstein monster, but over time as like the economy has gotten worse, um, people kind of started to realize that they didn't have to pay him because his name is public domain and so his wife is like you have to get a job and he's like freaking out because he kind of doesn't know how to sort of do that and I um, I worked for uh, Nickelodeon online and got laid off last year and so I'm kind of feeling the same things that Frankenstein is feeling sort of trying to deal with the bad job market and things. Even the monsters are having trouble with the economy. That's like, that'd be cool. But thank you so much. That's really cool. I'm like more interested now that you've explained all his, his situations to me. I'm here with a fantastic artist, Dave Raposa. This guy has some fantastic art uh, based on the Ninja Turtles. I know a lot of geeks out there know and love the Ninja Turtles. Now, uh, tell us, is this a personal project? Were you commissioned to do this? Is this for a company or for a comic book or something? This is like me making believe that I got an awesome job. So like, 
I do a lot of work for companies, like doing games, movie stuff, all that. But like on the side, I was like, I'm gonna take on like a big project. So I did uh, 15 redes well, not really redesigns, but just reinterpretations of all the Ninja Turtle characters I like the most. So like I did stuff from you know, the comics. I did stuff from like the old TV show. Just like the characters that stuck out to me when I was a little kid. Because I like, you know, grew up with the turtles like a lot of people did. So I was like super pumped to start and, you know, nobody was going to pay me to do it basically. So I just wanted to do it. When you watch it as a kid, you fill in the blanks with your, you know, your head, your imagination. Because it's like, it's super intense when you're little, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, I did Shredder. And to me, you know, when I was a kid, he's scary, he's intense, he's a villain, he's dangerous. So I wanted to, like, basically take what I thought as a kid and bring it into what I can do now as an artist. So I was like, you know, I'll scar him up, I'll put blood all over him, I'll make him intense, but I'll keep him looking exactly the same, just try and make him real. Now, uh, what's the medium you use for uh, this, this project? All of them are digital. All of them are digital? Yeah, so I just use, like, a Wacom... Into a four tablet, and uh, that's what I do for all my jobs. But yeah, I just like you know, just busted ass in between jobs, just trying really hard to make time for it. So now, is there any other classic like '80s cartoons, maybe that you were a fan of as a child, that you'll probably do with something similar with? Yeah, I did it uh, before I decided that it was something I like really wanted to focus on. I started like doing like mini series, so. Uh, before I did this one, which is which was a long process, it took me six months to do all 15 in between jobs. So before that, I did Thundercats. So I did like a lion o and I made him basically like a real lion with like long hair, sort of the same style, like realistic. And he was like, you know, intense and strong. And I just wanted to do like a adult versions, but the main thing I try to do in all of them is like keep them really really true to the original design like I don't change anything I just try and like make it real because that's the thing I hate about like interpretations they like they try and dark knight everything so they like add on like these fucking like hexagons all over them and it's like fuck that it looks like shit so it's like just stay true to what everybody already loves because you're not better than what they love that is true now you mentioned other projects uh, what other projects can you uh, explain on elaborate on uh, well, right now, for like a personal project, I'm doing Akira. I started up and I did a... I finished Tetsuo. So I have a Tetsuo, he's like, you know, guy with all the, the metal arm and everything. So I like did this... Uh, I'm doing like sort of uh, half-body portraits of them in the same way I'm doing the Ninja Turtles, but trying to go like more realistic than I even did on those. I'm taking like, you know, reference and posing people. I'm finding people that look like the characters. Well, they already look like, they're already people, so it's not that hard to I, get into realis realism. Yeah, but it's like anime, so I mean, like on like Tetsuo, they all have like huge foreheads and shit like that. So I'm still trying to like stay true in a way. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And aside from that, I do, I'm doing, uh, I do magic cards for like a living, and I do, uh, I'm working on like the new Thor movie and stuff like that. All right, now uh, is that you have a website or a Facebook or anything yep. type of social media thing to plug? Yeah, if you go to my website, just DaveRaposa.com, you can get like everything else. Like I'm on like CG Hub, DeviantArt, uh, ConceptArt.org. Can't think of anything else. I'm on like everything though. I have like a Facebook page, everything. I'm here with Alex Finbo, the editor of The Loxleys and The War of 1812. Alex, what can you tell us about this book? Uh, well, it's a 102-page graphic novel written by Alan Grant. Uh, you may know him from Lobo, uh, Hellblazer, Judge Dredd, uh, Batman. Um, he's part of our company. We're a creator-owned company. Uh, so we do the stories we're passionate about. So we wanted to do something about the, the Americans and the Canadians, the British, all uh, kicking off in 1812 and trying to, to kick each other's butts. Um, so Alan's written a really good story about this family called the Loxleys that lived uh, just uh, north of the American border at the beginning of the war and how the war affected them. So it's a beautiful comic strip. Uh, it's all historically accurate, so every event that happens in the comic book happened in real life, but it's also a really, really good story. Um, how did you originally hear about the story that you wanted to tell? Ah, okay. So uh, I'm from England originally, so I've lived in Canada. I could not tell. No? <laughs> I've not developed my Brooklyn accent well enough. Well, I'll work on it, yeah. The right. trick to a Brooklyn accent is to just take whatever sentence you're saying and make it one whole word. Like, what are you doing for dinner? What are you doing for dinner? What are you doing for dinner? 
There you go. What are you doing for dinner? There you go. 20. Good. Okay, all right, now we're rolling. All right, I'll try and do the rest of it in, the, in that kind of an accent. So I was, in a, I was in a store, right, and my wife was trying on some boots, and uh, I was bored, so I just looked around and there was this book called The War of 1812. I was like, it's Napoleon, it's Wellington, it's going to be boring European stuff. I looked through it and it's like, there's the White House on fire. Wow, there's, there's Toronto on fire. What the hell? So I did some research into it and found out about all this stuff which had happened. I thought, why doesn't anybody know about this stuff? I mean, the White House being burned down? Seriously? By the Canadians? What? So uh, I talked to Alan because we were working on a horror comic together. And he said, yeah, I'll do an adaptation of that. Let's do the research and we'll do a really nice book. And I've got two girls, two daughters, um, and they're not going to read a historical book. Now, they aren't going to read it. And I know from the, the kids that I teach the visual uh, storytelling classes in school, they're not going to read a historical book either. But you show them a comic book with great characters in it, with beautiful artwork and a really good story, then they'll read it and they'll learn the history at the same time. So that's what we started doing. And that was two years ago. And we're just getting to the point now where the book's coming together. Uh, Claude Senneban has been doing the pencils and inks. And he's on page 95 at the moment. So we're almost there. And Laverne's colouring is, is, is brilliant. And Alan's story has got those moments where you're like, oh, I want to find out what happens next. And then there's the, the tragedy, which kind of like gets a tear in your eyes and a lump in your stomach. And then there's some romance in there as well to, to give you a bit of everything. So like if you were a teacher who was actually teaching the War of 1812, they could effectively use your book to you know, teach their kids. Yes. There's a 64-page historical summary written by a military historian, a, Mike, a guy called Mark Zulke, who wrote a really, really good book on the subject. He summarized his 500-page book into 64 pages, which illustrated them with maps. You can get everything you need to know about why America started the war, how it ended, how it affected all the different people involved um, in 64 pages. So you've basically got the cliff notes of your entire textbook about 1812 and a comic book all in one. Honestly, I wish they had that shit when I was in school. Now, aside from that, we also have this book called Shame Conception, uh, this is issue one of three. Now, this looks like it's a pretty dark and kind of twisted tale. The artwork, for one thing, is beautiful. I just want to say that. It looks like watercolor, but uh, if you know the medium, I would love for you to tell me that. Uh, what can you tell us about the plot line of this book? Okay, well, uh, Shame is uh, written by Laverne Kajerski and uh, painted by John Bolton, and it is watercolor. Every page in the book is a single watercolor canvas, okay, and there's no digital work in there at all. How's that for an art school education? And it's the best work of his career. I mean, it's absolutely stunning, the work he's doing. It's dark fantasy. It's a fairy tale on the old style of fairy tales, like a fairy tale for grown-ups. Um, a story about a, a daughter and a mother and their battle against uh, the, the evil father in their triangle of a relationship. I don't want to say too much because I'll give it away, the plot. But uh, it's, uh, it came out for us uh, last month and it's been our bestseller already. And it's just... Uh, it's just a stunning book in its own right. And the second book's out next year. Speaking of selling, where can our fans pick these up? Uh, it should be available in every comic book store and in some bookstores too. Uh, if Diamond say that they can't get it, then they just need a, a prod. You can come to our website and tell us, and we'll make sure they get it in. They've reordered four times, so uh, it's, it's, it should be out there for everybody to get a hold of. What's your website? Uh, RenegadeArtsEntertainment.com. Awesome. Alex, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Enjoy the show, man. Thank you. You too. Take care. We're here in 2011 New York City Comic Con with our good friend Vincent Vlado from Sci-Fi Ninja Theater. Vinny, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Pete's Basement. I'm so grateful to be on your show. You're grateful? That doesn't sound like you're actually grateful. Now, are you just lying to me to get my affection? No, I would blow you to be on this show. I normally charge for that kind of a service, but today, I'll tell you what, we'll talk, all right, after. We'll talk after. All right, after, after, after. <laughs> uh-huh. So, wh tell me, I mean, you are aficionado of all the beautiful women. I want you to tell me, how do you rate today from, like, 1 to 10, 10 being the best, on beautiful women here at the New York City Comic Con. Well, actually, they're friggin' gorgeous, dude. I mean, the pair of tits that I've been seeing all over the place are phenomenal. I've been on uh, c cable TV for 15 years. 1996 was my first show. This is an original podcast, my friend. This is back in the day. This is, this is public access TV coming right at you, okay? <laughs> You know, it's cool because, like, when I started, right, a little bit after, everyone was telling me about your show. Hey, man, you, if you love what you're doing, you got to check out Pete's Basement. And I was like, all right, you know, but I never got the chance at, at first. Then, then my friend was like, come here, sit down. So he, he pushes up. I was like, 
Holy shit, this is fucking great. Wow, thank you, Vinny. That's that's very that's a big compliment. Believe me, we're all big fans of you. Good. I, I love your stuff just as much as you probably hate mine. <laughs> wow, so me and Vinny are going to go jerk each other off now in the corner over there. <laughs> all right, guys, I want to say goodbye. Remember, check them out, Sci-Fi Ninja Theater. Last word to Vin. Watch my show or die. You heard it here first. He's coming for you. you don't know, we're talking to one of the greatest uh, uh, fantasy graphic novel artists of all time, D. Joff Darrow, illustrated, uh, hard-boiled, one of my favorite artists of all time. Uh, we're gonna take a look, he's being very generous in signing uh, all these uh, uh, prints for, for his fans here, and we're going to, uh, uh, <laughs> total bullshit he said, and, and he's probably right, but uh, anyway, he's gonna be nice enough to have us talk to him for a couple minutes. Uh, so, uh, Joff, uh, your style is so like uh, intricate and uh, technical. Did you always want to do fantasy graphic uh, graphic novels? Well, <laughs> I feel like uh, no. <laughs> I just I don't know. I just started like drawing that way. I don't. I always kind of thought to this day. I don't think I draw very well, but I thought if I put a lot of effort into it, at least they'll give me an A for effort and. You know, like, well, this guy doesn't do very good, but boy, he sure does put a lot of crap into it. Sure do try hard, huh? So how long have you been doing it for? Comics? Yeah. Long, too long, probably. A long time. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's just... Different stuff. I mean, it, I, I did a lot of work in animation and advertising and... Your stuff is very technical, it's very highly detailed, it's very dimensional. I mean, you sure you you don't have like an industrial designer somewhere deep down inside of you? I got an industrial Drano down inside of me, but no, I, I don't. Uh, no, no, I. No, not really. I mean, I you know, I think a lot of it comes from just like looking at Mobius because I think Mobius, who I, I got to know very well, uh, he can draw in three dimension, and I. I always want to be able to do that, and I. I could never draw machinery to save my life. And uh, I worked at Quaker Oats during the summer. I had a summer job there, and I worked in this gigantic area that had a lot of machines, and i just watch them and look at them. And I thought, I better learn how to draw mechanical things, because I don't want to be one of those guys that, well, I can't draw something, so I won't draw it. You know, like guys, I can't draw feet, so they always draw them from the waist up. You know, if, if you run away from what you can't draw, you kind of limit yourself, I think. But, anyway. Never go nowhere if you don't try, right? All right, man. Well, uh, I'm definitely going to pick up one of these prints here. You know, he's got his uh, Godzilla. He's got his hard-boiled. He's got a bunch of awesome stuff. Sheldon Cowboy, yes. Um, what, I mean, is there something you'd like to promote right now? Maybe just tell us your website. Sheldon Cowboy will be out in June. He's coming back, and he's it's action-packed. We're all looking forward to that. Now, uh, where can they get this? Over there that isn't. He told me. He doesn't want me to do it. Well, I was being nice to you, but, you know, I mean, we're, on, we're on camera. And I, I have that sort of insincerity meter. I can tell. Brought to you by Diet Coke. Yes. Which? Drink Coke. Is that the choice of a new generation? Six-pack for giving them that free product placement. It hasn't helped us any, but, you know, we'll see what we can do. All right, so... Uh, What's your, you got a website you want to, people can check your stuff out at? 
WWW Pornhub. No, that no, that's the one. Oh, that's the one I look at. No, I mean, uh, I don't know. No, I don't have a website. All right, well, uh, you know, you just Google him. You'll see him. It's a pretty good one. <laughs> All right, Joff. Thanks a lot, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you, honestly. And uh, there you get it, get it right there. Yeah. Good. Farmer's Handshake. Are you with A. David Lewis? And, uh, he did a project with J.K.? Yeah, that's right. Uh, J.K. and I have worked before on some stuff, but most recently he came aboard as what we're calling one of the anchor artists for the Tome of Chain World. Now, Chain World was actually a video game, uh, and the rare thing about this video game is that there's only one copy that exists anywhere. People play it and then pass it on, and they make changes that they want to make. And I thought this would be a great idea for a graphic novel. This is a real thing. This is a real oh, thing. Okay. Uh, it was started by Jason Rohrer, the uh, the video game, and now we're doing the comic book uh, version of that. Like version, inspiration of it. Uh, we had a Kickstarter campaign that was very successful. J.K. is aboard as an artist. Leah Hernandez, Shanda Free, uh, Jason Copeland, and Ben Toll, a number of Eisner nominees. What's going to be happening is the book is going to start with only J.K.'s cover and only one page completed. And then it's going to be passed from artist to artist at random until it hits one of the anchor artists. They're then going to contribute a page, and it's going to continue at random until all 200 pages are filled. How long, how long do you see that taking? To... We've estimated it'll probably take about two years. To get 200 pages, figure at best, someone doing a page in a week, uh, it's only going to be handed between trusted individuals, one artist who likes another artist's work. Is he a trusted individual? <laughs> He's trusted by me, and that's why we're starting this. That's right. The anchor artists uh, do receive uh, a fee for this, a retainer for being part of the project, and the rest of the artists or writers that might get involved uh, just sort of get the pleasure of being part of this organic, forming story. And did you do your part already? You did your? Okay. I'm starting a cover probably uh, this month, right? Or yeah, end of the month. End probably. of the month, yeah. Okay. That sounds really cool. So about two years, 2000? Two years, we're going to be tracking it and discussing it uh, online. There's an affiliated website that launches next month called the Tome, the-tome.com, and people should come check it out. So someone can just change the story however they see fit? Uh, they, they are uh, cautioned and encouraged to change the story usefully, creatively. So not just dump everything that came before, but if they see an opportunity to take it in a new direction, they should. So he can, so somebody can theoretically say, you know what, none of that ever happened. It was a dream. If it's gone to an artist that the previous artist trusts and endorses, and they see that it's best to take it in a dream sequence territory or virtual reality territory, then so be it. We have no control over that. So from an editorial standpoint, you wouldn't like say, oh no, we're not doing that. Nothing here can, nothing here can be censored or excised. There's only going to be one copy and we'll look at when it's concluded whether it forms a coherent whole and is something that's worth uh, sharing and distributing hello and distributing more widely uh, or if it was a one-time experiment that was just uh, interesting and creative for these different artists to take part in cool. well we'll look forward to that in a couple of years and we'll check out that site
shoes. <laughs> and see. Look at shop there, Pete. Thank you, sir. Podcast system and everything? I don't remember the question. Right. Too many comic books a week, shit spazzes out in his brain. Oh. I love talking to fans, that's what we do. First of all, I assure you I did not fought on this yet, so you got <laughs> great timing. I always do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good catch, Danny. See, it was perfectly taped to the wall. It's like we timed that. Are you filming this? Because this is good B roll. It's totally good B roll. I was born for this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather drunk for whiskey. Yeah. What's your favorite whiskey? Uh, well, Ben Nevis, 30 year old single malt. I've never had that, actually. I'm a single malt fan. I've never had that. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a moment. I will. That's awesome. What's up, guys? I'm here with Alex. Uh, let's try that again. <laughs> yeah, we need one. Alex Fimbo. Yeah, me too. Believe it, man. Are we work I like how you reference Police Squad. I mean, you know what you're talking oh, about. Police Squad. Gotta love that show, man. I mean, it was one of those shows that never... Yes. The reason it went off the air, they, the reason they, they said Police Squad went off the air, because it was one of those shows you had to watch. You couldn't just listen to it, which could be said of, I think, Arrested Development, which is just sheer genius. But... You really, that show you really had to listen to. I mean, it's, I think, one of the smartest things ever done on TV. And they're bringing it back. Thank God. I mean, they're bringing it back? Yeah, they're going to do 10, they said they were going to do 10 episodes. They're going to lead up to a movie. Really? Who's going to play Frank Drebin? Everybody's going to be, no, not, I'm talking about Arrested Development. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think Police Squads, well, they remake everything, so they're probably going to bring that back too. Yeah. I can't see them possibly doing that, but, you know. Well, yeah, they, I mean, you know, believe me, like McHale's Navy or any of those things, uh, or I think they did Sergeant Bilko with, uh, I don't know who played him, but they, they bring all those things back. They'll, in about five years, they'll get, uh, I don't know, Tom Cruise to do it or something. Or, what they do, Charlie's Angels three times already? Well, that, that Charlie's Angels is off. They cancel it already. <laughs> cancel it. Cancel three times, Charlie's Angels. Okay, let me, let me um, set this up here.